Before I even begin on the topic, I felt it was important to mention the concept of God's timing. How many times has someone said to you, well, it's all in God's timing, but what does that mean? I have heard, though they do not know exactly, but Job went through close to two years of trial before his breakthrough. Also, the children of Israel were over 400 years in bondage. Yet from the time Moses talked to the leaders of Israel until they left Egypt, it was not weeks, it was months. So though it may seem as if God is not even doing anything, He is, but it will in many ways be a lot longer than we expected. The children of Israel were slaves in Egypt. God has sent a deliverer named Moses. Exodus chapter 5 verses 1 and 2. And afterward Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. In many ways, that response comes from people today. God desires to make himself known to all, yet are we willing to do our part when God shows up? Let us consider some background. It was the mindset of Pharaoh that his very birth was a result of the gods. It was believed that Pharaoh was born a god, so to him, the god of the Hebrews was laughable insult to who he was. People ask us today, where is your God since you are not in a good situation? Well, they need to stand back and see the salvation of the Lord. And many times God has to allow things to be desperate before he moves. Otherwise, people will say, that was just a coincidence. They need to see it is the Lord that is moving on their behalf. So we're looking at the ten judgments of God on Egypt. For your reference, we're looking at Exodus chapter 7, verses, verse 14, through chapter 12, verse 36. The ten judgments were poured out on the Egyptians. These judgments, commonly called plagues, may be grouped into three units of three plagues each. Plague number 1, 4, and 7. Plagues were announced in the morning with the warning. Plagues 2, 5, and 8 were announced in the palace with the warning. Plague 3, 6, and 9 were given with no warning. And of course, the tenth is the final plague. In the first set of plagues, there would be discomfort. The second set of plagues, the devastation of personal property. The third set of plagues would involve some type of death. The plagues were used to bring deliverance to the children of Israel in Exodus 12.12. 12, the purpose of the plagues was to bring judgment on the gods of Egypt. However, unknowingly overlooked, it's the principle that both Egypt and Israel would know the Lord. Now, there were no clear-cut patterns to the gods of Egypt. Some were kind of like multitasking and did many things, while some may be a god of one particular thing. Also, depending on where you live, there was different gods for each region that would be worshipped, even though they had the same function. So, the north part of the, of the Nile may be controlled by a different god than the southern part. The view of gods was that of, te, of, that of a certain territory and a plurality in number, as we will see by the first play. Now, there were three popular gods that were worshipped as the gods of the Nile. Quote, The plagues brought upon the land of Egypt served not only to demonstrate the inability of the king of Egypt, his priest, and the people to resist the power of God, but it served as a visual lesson to Israel regarding the, worthless, the worthlessness of idolatrous forms of worship. Page 98 from the book Studies in Exodus by John J. Davis, and I will be quoting from some sources online, which I may not mention, but this book I highly recommend concerning this section on the plagues and even the, the rest of the book of Exodus. So, the first plague, the great river, the Nile, will be turned to blood, and this will last for seven days. 
Exodus chapter 7 verse 17. Thus saith the Lord, In this thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will smite with the rod that is in mine hand upon the waters which are in the river, and they shall be turned to blood. The first plague happened in the morning, verse 5. The first principle that we can see is that they shall know that I am the Lord. Whatever God needed to be, He will be because He is the great I Am. He's not limited to any particular task or territory. The Nile was considered as the source of life to the Egyptians. Kind of like the smartphone is the source of life to teenagers today. The three most popular gods of the Nile were, one, happy. This obese Happy, one of the children of Horus, he had a big belly, breast like a woman, and made sure the Nile would overflow every year to help the soil be rich. Every year when the Nile would flood, it would be considered the manifestation of happy. However, happy after this plague was not too happy and was cons considered disgusting to the Egyptians, and thus the first thoughts of doubt would occur. Exodus 7, chapter 7, verse 18 says, And the fish that is in the river shall die, and the river shall stink, and the Egyptians shall loathe to drink of the water of the river. So one would wonder what is going on with happy. The second one is Osiris, not Miley Cyrus, but Osiris. This was the god of the underworld. Since the Nile was considered his blood flowing to bring life, this plague would cast doubt on the real health of this god. The next one is Kunan. The ram god was the guardian of the Nile. What's wrong with this picture? I'm not sure if his security cameras were down. We don't know for sure. But he did not stop the river from becoming blood. So why did Pharaoh react the way he did? And what's wrong with that picture? Exodus chapter 7, verses 22 and 23. And the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Neither did he hearken unto them, as the Lord had said. And Pharaoh turned and went into the house, neither did he set his heart to this also. This is a real vengeance for the innocent, because I want to bring out something here. Earlier in Exodus, we read that all the male babies were to be killed. Exodus chapter 1, verses 15 through 17. The religious custom, however, was to sacrifice a girl every year to the Nile. Of course, some say, well, we don't do that today. <clears throat> What's Planned Parenthood, by the way? Well, not in the Nile, but just go by a new name. So, the river would be turned to blood and thus served as a reminder of all the innocent blood of those baby cries. That which is said to be the source of life became the source of death. Another point, not only did the fish in the river die, but it stank. Notice what is said of the Nile before this happened. Quote, In the hymn of the Nile, the bringer of food, rich in provision, creator of all good, Lord of majestic, sweet of fragrance. Why weren't the gods accountable for not doing their job? I mean, shouldn't they have been fired? When's the last time you ever heard an atheist mock the Egyptian gods instead of the Lord? Why did the magicians make more bloody water? Hmm? Oh, we got the we got COVID nineteen virus. Oh, we can make more. Yeah. Why couldn't they turn it back to water like Moses did? They can only add more misery to the matter to make it worse. This plague lasted for one week. So here's a principle. Only God can cleanse that which has become unclean. Thank God for Jesus, for we are all as an unclean thing before Him. Yet by the work of the cross, we become rivers of living water. The second plague is the plague of frogs. Exodus chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. And the Lord spake unto Moses, Go unto Pharaoh, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. And if thou refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite all the borders or territory with 
frogs. Verses 3 and 4 states, And the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into thine house, and into thy bedchamber, and upon thy bed, and into thy house of thy servants, and upon thy people, and into thine ovens, and into thy kneading troughs. And the frogs shall come up both on thee, and upon thy people, and upon all thy servants. Quote, the frog was one of a number of sacred animals that might not be intentionally killed, and even their involuntary slaughter was often punished with death. Folks, this would not be a good time to have a wedding. I mean, imagine having a wedding. Is there anyone here that feels these two should not be married? Ribbit, ribbit. Or can you imagine being on your honeymoon and all of a sudden a bunch of frogs saying ribbit? Just a thought. Let's concern ourselves with the goddess Hecate that had a form of a woman with a frog's head, some considered just to be a frog. From her nostrils, it was believed, came the very breath of life that brought life in the womb of those created by her husband, the great god. You remember we mentioned Kunan before? From the dust of the earth. I mean, shouldn't they have gotten rid of that god and fired him? Because he didn't do a good job of the guardian of the, of the Nile. Now, she was the goddess that assisted with childbirth. Since the Nile was considered the source, and this goddess was the god of childbirth, the frogs represented this god producing life out of the Nile. You're saying, okay, so... Sometimes people say, I want a miracle. However... We learn by Pharaoh that no matter what God does, some will not be convinced to turn to the Lord because their heart is that hardened. It's just the way things are sometimes. Can you imagine being a parent? Finally get your newborn to sleep and then you start hearing ribbit? Just a thought. Now, I'm not sure where the game Frogger would fit in with this message, but it just came to mind. I kind of enjoyed the game. I don't think there's nothing wrong with it, actually. So... Pharaoh asked Moses to get rid of them. And here's the response. Exodus chapter 8, verses 7 through 15. In verse 8, Pharaoh says, Pray to God to rid of all these frogs, and I'll release the people so you can make their sacrifice and worship God. Moses said to Pharaoh, Certainly. Uh, by the way, set the time. When you do want these frogs out of here, away from your servants and the people and out of your houses, You'll be rid of the frogs except for those in the Nile. Uh, make it tomorrow. Moses said, tomorrow it is. So you realize there is no God like our God. The frogs will be gone, you and your houses and your servants and your people, free of frogs. Verse 13, God responded to Moses' prayer. The frogs died off, houses, courtyards, fields, all free of frogs. Verse 14, they piled the frogs in heaps. The country reeked of dead frogs. Verse 15. But when Pharaoh saw that he had some breathing room, he got stubborn again and wouldn't let, listen to Moses and Aaron, just as God has said. Now, whatever happened to the breath of life? You remember the goddess? I mean, did she run out of breath? I mean, she was supposed to give the breath of life, but she couldn't sustain life. To the magicians, whatever happened to, now you see it, now you don't. The first plague, the river stank. The second, the land stank. Now here's a principle. Only our God can bring a popular balance when we take control. Watch out. Notice the frogs in the Nile would remain. This plague, in my opinion, might be done a little differently today. Though I see no problem when people want to get the latest electronic wonder of today. However, let's say that the new iPhone next year is going to launch as a foldable phone. People camp out for days to get one. And yet they get it, and then it just breaks down. The very thing they love, now would hate. Quote, a special interest in the dialogue is the fact that Moses requested Pharaoh to name the time when this plague should end, a D not even attempted by the magicians. End quote. Page 110. One last thought. I think that God has a real sense of humor. It occurred to me as I was studying that the next plague involved that which the frogs eat. Just kind of a sense of humor. Because sometimes when you really need something, they're not there to help you out. 
so let's look at the third plague, the plague of lice or gnats. Exodus chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. And the Lord said unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch out thy rod and smite the dust of the land, that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And they did so. For Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod and smote the dust of the earth. And it became lice in man and in beast. And all the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. This plague came without warning. Gnats creep into the eyes and nose, and they have a sting that causes a painful irritation. The priests in Egypt were known for their physical purity. Daily rites were performed by a group of priests known as the Pure Ones. Their purity was basically physical rather than spiritual. They were circumcised, shaved the hair from their heads and bodies, and washed frequently, and were dressed in beautiful linen robes. In light of this, it would seem rather doubtful that the priesthood in Egypt could function very effectively, having been polluted by the presence of these insects. They, like their worshippers, were inflicted with the pestilence of this occasion. Their prayers were made ineffective by their own personal impurity with the presence of gnats on their bodies. Here the Lord polluted the religionists with pesty insects. Just to show how crazy everything is, I want to talk about the dressing of a god. This is what supposedly the priest did. Now, there's no cameras to show how this actually happened, but this is supposedly what these priests did. Check this out from the book by John J. Davis, Study in Exodus and check out what it says. It's quite interesting. Every morning the priest entered the Holy of Holies, making sure the door was bolted. He would open the door and see the God who was supposed to have slept during the evening. I didn't realize God slept. He would wake up and present him with various garments, including headdresses and insignias and then proceeded to dress him. After the god had been dressed, he ate the first meal. I don't know if they had Captain Crunch or what, folks. Other meals followed throughout the day. Hopefully he didn't have acid reflux. That's, that's not a good thing. The, followed the day, the evening, his insignia and garments were removed, and he was put back and was put back in the shrine. While this was done, hymns had, been, had to be recited and songs sung. Much of the ceremony was accompanied by dances performed by professional dancers. This ritual was pretty much the same in all temples with only slight variations. Okay, Exodus 8.19. I don't think a temp agency could would hire these guys to trust a God. I, just my gut feeling. Exodus 8.19 says, Then the magician said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he Hearken not unto them, as the Lord has said. They basically said, ah, this is beyond our, this is above our pay grade. While the magicians were able to imitate the first two plagues and thus add to misery, more misery, this one they acknowledged was the finger of God. Thus, the Nile is not the source of life, but the spirit of God is. Sometimes the gnats are called ghosts since they are in swarms. Maybe God was making fun of it since it is the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, that does give life. Remember, we are but dust until the Spirit of God breathes life into us. From the New Living Translations, Job 33, verses 4, verse 4 says, For the Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. In verses 14 and 15, If God were to take back His Spirit and withdraw His breath, all life would cease and humanity would turn again to dust. Now, this particular plague was probably against the god Jeb. He is the god of the earth. I guess the gnats did not follow the limit of occupancy signs. They probably could not read the no trespassing signs either. By the way, Set, the god of the desert, will give him an honorable mention here. And of course, people say, well, we don't have a god of the earth today. <clears throat> I don't know, Al Gore, for some reason, rings a bell. But anyway, principle, only the Spirit of God and, and can sustain life. 
this concludes the first set of plagues, this would upset the comfort zone. So now let's consider the second set of plagues. In the next set of plagues, God will separate the children of Israel from the Egyptians. Thus, the children of Israel will not be affected by the plagues. These plagues would cause ruin to the Egyptians' personal property. The fourth plague is that of flies. Exodus chapter 8, verses 20 to 23. And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh. Lo, he cometh forth to the water, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. Else if thou wilt not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies upon thee, and upon thy servants, and upon thy people, and into thy houses. And the houses of the Egyptians shall be full of swarms of flies, and also the ground wherein they are. And I will sever in that day the land of Goshen, in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there, to the end that thou mayest know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. And I will put a division between my people and thy people. Tomorrow shall be shall the sign be. Now concerning insects, Exodus chapter 8, verses 20 through 32. The fourth plague was foretold to Pharaoh in the morning as he came out to the water. Doubtless for worship, it consisted of swarms of insects. Yet one of the most likely possibilities is pretty interesting. They had what they called a dung beetle. The insect is about the size of a nickel and feeds on dung in the fields or the side of the road. When animals def defecate, these insects swarm from their holes in the ground, collect the dung for future meals by forming it into round balls, about the size of a cough ball, which they roll across the ground to their underground dwelling. So, parents, do you still want your kids to go out and play? This is the first plague in which there is a separation of the Egyptians and the children of Israel. At this point, all the plagues were an irritation, but not a major loss. However, that would begin to change with the next plague. That which may be natural in the animal kingdom is not natural for us. Just because animals eat dung, eat their mate alive after mating, or eat their young does not mean we should go and do likewise. Neither should our standards be based on the animal kingdom, but on the word of God. Of course, we do not promote filthy habits or lifestyles today, right? Think about that. Maybe we do. Principle, idolatry is seedbed to perversion, Romans chapter 1. I want to quote from BiblesQuote.com. Now, I'm probably going to butcher this God's name, but I don't think he's going to come after me because it doesn't exist. Quote, the Egyptians felt they didn't need to worry much about it because one of the most powerful gods, the God of creation who moved the sun, was in control of insects. The name of this god was Kepari, and not only were both beetles and flies supposedly under his control, but he was thought to be such a powerful god he even controlled creation and personally moved the sun across the sky each day. The Egyptians depicted Kepari with a dung beetle for its head. Dung beetles got their name from the fact that they are always seen rolling balls of dung across the ground to their homes. If anyone should have the authority over the flies, the Egyptians believe it should it be a god with a dung beetle for a head. As the dung beetle rolled a big ball of dung around, along the ground, so the Egyptians thought their, this god rolled the sun across the sky each day. It is interesting both the flies and dung beetles have one thing in common, dung. They're both attracted to dung. So basically, this is a dung god. Notice what the Apostle Paul said, Philippians 2, 3, 8. Yet doubtless, and I count all things but loss, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Now let's consider the fifth plague, the plague on the Egyptian cattle. Exodus chapter 9, verses 1 through 7 are your references. Verse 3 says, Behold, the hand of the Lord will come with a very severe pestilence on your livestock, which are in the field. One very important note. Some atheists say that there's a contradiction since all the cattle died. But notice it speaks of those which are in the field. 
It doesn't say all, but those which are in the field. Now, the plague would hit the economy. This was a huge blow to the Egyptians, both in who they worshipped and economically. Quote, such a plague would have a grave economic consequences in the land of Egypt. Oxen were dependent upon for heavy labor in agriculture. Camels, asses, and horses were used largely for transportation. End quote. Think of the state of Texas and imagine if all the trucks broke down. How would work even get done? These animals were the power tools of that day, just like the trucks are for our day. Keep that in mind. Then there's the religious consequences. Quote, the Apis bull was considered the sacred animal of the god Ptah. Therefore, the associate worship at the site of Memphis is readily understood. There was at one time only one sacred Apis bull. When the Apis bull dies, priests would travel throughout every pasture in Egypt looking for his replacement. The calf would have a black coat with the distinctive patches on his neck, back, and body. The Apis bull supposedly had the power of prophecy. When the Apis bull died, the land of Egypt mourned for him as they would for the loss of the monarch himself. After death, his body would be embalmed. He was even given funeral rites. The sacred bull was supposed to have been recognized by 28 distinctive marks that identified him as deity and indicated that he was the object of worship. Well, when I think of a bull, folks, I kind of think of a bunch of stupid guys getting chased by them in the streets of Spain, so I'll pass for that. Quote, Another deity whose worship would have been affected by the impact of this plague was Hathor, the goddess of love, beauty, and joy, represented by the cow. In Upper Egypt, the goddess appears as a woman with the head of a cow. Hathor was the symbolic mother of Pharaoh, and thus an attack on Pharaoh. Now, when I think of a cow, I think it's dinner time. You know, where's the beef? By the way, thank God we don't do that today, right? Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, wait a minute. Just thought of something. What about India? By the way, most scholars believe that this plague was some sort of anthrax. Principle, God is our source for all provision. Psalms chapter 20, verse 7. Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Okay, the sixth plague, the plague of boils and blisters. Exodus chapter 9, verses 8 through 12. And the Lord said unto Moses and unto Aaron, Take to you handfuls of ash, ashes of the furnace, and let Moses sprinkle it toward the heaven in the sight of Pharaoh. And it shall become small dust in all the land of Egypt, and it shall be a boil breaking forth with sores upon man and upon beasts throughout all the land of Egypt. And he took ashes of the furnace and stood before Pharaoh, and Moses sprinkled it up toward heaven, and it became a boil breaking forth with sores upon man and upon beasts. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boils were upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had spoken unto Moses. I'm going to paraphrase a quote concerning a custom. It was their custom to take ashes of human sacrifices, meaning the Egyptians, and cast them into the air. As they go by the wind over the populace, they were viewed as a blessing. It is inferred by some that this heathen custom was the source of the practice of putting ashes on the forehead. Of course, no one does that today, right? Mm-hmm. Of course, we wouldn't do that today, right? Moses launched this plague of this practice and may have even had access to the very furnaces used in the sacred priesthood used in the royal temple. Now, before this, the magicians would do their tricks. Now, Moses would take of their own rituals and get different results. Some commentaries have suggested the ashes from the furnace symbolized the hard labor that Pharaoh would exercise toward the children of Israel. As a result, they would suffer blisters themselves from it. What comes around goes around. Payback can be a real blister sometimes. Notice the magicians could not even stand before Moses. This play would be directed to the gods of health and healing. 
their whole health care system just crashed. So here are some of the gods that this plague made a laughing stock of. Set meant a lion-headed goddess with an alleged power over disease. Do I hear malpractice lawsuit in the works? Another one is Serapis. He was a healing god in which some of the apostles dealt with at his temple. There were tables set aside for offerings, and it is possible what the apostle Paul referred to in 1 Corinthians 10, 21. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. Maybe it sheds some light on communion, for it is in remembrance of him a non-mixture of idolatry that we protect. Then there's impotent. Some call him the god of medicine, and some scholars state he was a man that possibly used spells and potions to bring healing. There's not enough concrete information to make anything of him. And then there's Isis. Not those guys out in Iraq and Syria, but their most celebrated goddess, actually was their most celebrated goddess, was considered as a preventer or healer of all diseases. For this goddess used to reveal herself to people in their sleep when they labored under any disorder and afford them relief. Many who placed their confidence in her influence, according to the claim, were miraculously restored. Many likewise who had been despaired of and given over by the physicians on account of their condition were saved by this goddess. Numbers who had been deprived of eyes and of other parts of their bodies were all restored on their application to Isis. By this disorder, therefore, which no application to their gods could cure, and which upon the magicians also were supposed to possess most power influence, God confronted their pride, showed the folly of their worship, and the vanity of their dependence. The means by which these boils and sores were afflicted, the sprinkling of ashes from the furnace, was particularly appropriate. In several cities of Egypt, they were accustomed to sacrifice human beings, which they burned alive upon a high altar. At the close of the sacrifice, the priests gathered the ashes of these victims and scattered them in the air. It was considered a blessing. The like was done by Moses with the ashes of the furnace, that wheresoever any, the smallest portion, it might prove a plague and a curse to this cruel, ungrateful people. Thus there was a designated contracts in the work contrasts in the working of the province that apparent opposition to the superstition of the times. Wow. But what's the principle we can learn from that? Be careful what you believe. It can be fatal to you and your loved ones. Okay, now we're going to look at the last set of plagues. Here we will see death for the first time. So the seventh plague is that of hail. Exodus chapter 9 verses 16 through 21 is the reference. In verse 18 it says, Behold, tomorrow about this time I will cause it to rain a very grievous hail, such as has not been in Egypt since the foundation thereof even until now. Send therefore now and gather thy cattle and all that thou hast in the field, for upon every man and beast which thou shalt be found in the field it shall not be brought home, the hail shall come down upon them and they shall die. He that feareth the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his cattle flee into the houses. He that regards not the word of the Lord left his servants and his cattle in the field. Verse 24, So there was a hail and fire mingled with hail, very grievous, such as there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. When it speaks of hail and fire, it is implying hail and lightning. By the way, the rainfall total was normally about two inches a year. So, though they did get some rain, rarely did they see hail, and certainly not at this level. Now, the average annual rainfall for Dallas, Texas, for example, is 40 inches. Here's something to bring out according to my sources. The Egyptians used flax to make linen cloth that they preferred over wool. The Egyptian priests, among other people, dressed in linen. This plague was a judgment on them, therefore. The Egyptians used barley to make beer and as animal food, but the poor people also ate it. So there goes the uniforms and there goes your Budweiser. So... Some of the gods that would be humbled were Set, 
remember the god of the desert? He was an honorable mention in the plague of gnats, has a second-hand job as the god of storms. And then there's Osiris, the god of crops and fertility. The same clown that was mentioned in the first plague as the god of the underworld, and that, quote, river Nile was his bloodstream, end quote. And then there's Nu, spelled nut, which he is a nut, the sun goddess. She basically would stretch out like a semicircle with one end touching the ground with her fingertips and the other with her toes. Her dad would hold her up. As long as he held her up, there was calm. She was considered the mother of the sun and moon. New gives birth to the sun god daily, and he passes over her body during the day before being swallowed at night, only to be reborn the next morning. This goddess was supposed to protect their crops from the weather. And then, of course, there's the god Set. For Set, the hail was above his pay grade. Osiris did not even cover the crops, did not even bother to ask somebody for some garbage bag. Finally, New, or as spelled Nut, lost all respect as a result of this plague. So, she could swallow the sun and moon, but hail just swept her off her feet, literally. She's the mother of the next god that judged and yet had many children. Of course, we don't worship this guy today, right? Well, of course, there's a thing called horoscopes. You know, like, what sign are you? Hmm. But here's the principle. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 1.7 The eighth plague was that of the locusts. For reference, Exodus chapter 10, verses 3 through 6. In verse 4, it says, Else if thou refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow will I bring the locusts into thy coast. They shall cover the face of the earth, that one cannot be able to see the earth. Wow. I mean, they're going to go everywhere, basically, the pa passage is talking about. Exodus chapter 10, verses 12 through 15 so Moses stretches forth his rod, and all these locusts come flying in. Now, a locust will consume its own weight each day. Locust swarms have been known to cover as many as 400 square miles, and even one square mile could team with over 100 million insects. Some key thoughts here. The amount of locusts was so much that the sky would be darkened. This plague though against more than one god, yet the god Seth, the god of storms and disorder, would be the primary target. He had red hair, red eyes, and was feared. Isis gets an honorable mention. I think this plague proved who should be feared. It is known that one square mile of locusts consists of over 100 million insects. When covering the ground, it may be between 6 to 8 inches thick. In modern history in Africa, it has been noted to have a swarm of locusts consisting of over 400 miles. Note in the last plague, the flax and barley were destroyed. However, the wheat was not harmed until now. There was a very popular scripture that many quote from concerning our country. Here it is. Second Chronicles 7.14 If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways and will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. However, what does the verse before this say? Verse 13. If I ever shut off the supply of rain from the skies or order the locusts to eat crops or send a plague on my people. Verse 14 from the message translation says, and my people, my God-defined people, respond by humbling themselves, praying, seeking my presence, and turning their backs on their wicked lives. I'll be ready for you. I'll listen from heaven, forgive your sin, and restore the land to health. Also, the importance of rendering to God what is His, which we will cover in the last play. Malachi 3.11 And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. He shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fur fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. Principle, repentance and prayer bring restoration. This we should apply to our time, not just to the time of Pharaoh. The ninth plague was the plague of darkness. Exodus chapter 10 verses 21 through 29. Verse 21, And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt 
even darkness which may be felt. And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They saw not one another, neither rose up any from his place for three days, but all the children of Israel had light in their dwelling. And Pharaoh called unto Moses and said, Go ye, serve the Lord, only let your flocks and your herds be stayed. Let your little ones also go with you. And Moses said, Thou must give us also sacrifices and burnt offerings, that we may sacrifice unto the Lord our God. Our cattle also go with us. There shall not even a hoof be left behind, for therefore thereof must we take to serve the Lord our God. And we must know with what we must serve the Lord until we come hither. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let them go. And Pharaoh said unto him, Get thee from me, take thee. He to thyself, see my face no more, for in the day that thou seest my face, thou shalt die. And Moses said, Thou hast spoken well, I will see thy face again no more. So let's look at the ninth plague, because there's three days of complete darkness against Ra, the sun god. Kind of interesting when it talks about that the sun, the most worshipped god in Egypt, other than Pharaoh himself, gave no light. The Lord showed that he had control over the sun as a witness that God of Israel had ultimate power over life and death. The psychological and religious impact would have a profound influence on the Egyptians at this point. Darkness represented death, judgment, and hopelessness. Darkness was a complete absence of light. One thing to remember is this, one that is in darkness does not see the same as one that is in the light. Thus the reality that as clear as day is foolishness to them. They have been accustomed to darkness so long they feel safe in what they know instead of being free and doing something different. From Job 10.22 The land of sunless gloom as intense darkness, the land of the shadow of death without any order and where light is as thick as darkness. Job 12, 25, they grope in the dark without light, and he makes them to stagger and wander like a drunken man. Finally, Proverbs 4, 19, the way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not what they stumble. The principle, the more God removes his curtain of grace, the darker it becomes. Well, let's look at the last and final plague. In the last three plagues, we not only saw the introduction of death, but that of increasing darkness. The final plague is what would be the killer. In modern terms, the, the Green Reaper. The death of the firstborn. Exodus chapter 12, verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both a man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Notice this one plague will cover everything. Exodus chapter 12, verses 29 and 30. And it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne, unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. Now, I do cover the Passover in another video, and I will link it, but because it needs to be taught thoroughly. However, in brief, the children of Israel were to slay a lamb for each household. They were to put the blood on the door in the shape of a cross. Thus, when the angel of the Lord would see it, he would pass over and not destroy the firstborn. However, the Egyptians would be devastated. Now, here's what you need to think about. Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, was worshipped by the Egyptians because he was considered to be the greatest Egyptian god of all. It was believed he was actually the sun god Ra himself manifested in the flesh. This play was directed against all the gods of Egypt. This was the one plague in which faith was required from the children of Israel. They had to apply the blood. The principle is, are you under the blood? What can we take from all these plagues is the fact that the Lord is in control. And even today, we should be open to when the Lord shows 
the gods of our day as useless and that he is God of all gods. Consider this COVID-19 virus. There will come a point when it will end, but the bigger question will be, what will become of us when it does?